Hello, I'm Spencer Levy, Chairman of America's Research and Senior Economic Advisor at CBRE, and this is The Weekly Take, where we share our unique insights on what matters most in commercial real estate and the world at large. Today, I'm excited to be joined by my friend and colleague, Melina Cordero, the Managing Director of Retail Capital Markets for the Americas. But first, let's take a look at last week's developments. Rent collections took center stage in commercial real estate this week as landlords anxiously awaited April rent checks in all asset types. Early tallies for April show that office, multifamily, and industrial performed well, though to no surprise, retail has disappointed. Despite the relatively good news outside of retail and rent collection, many in the industry believe that May collections will be an even more important barometer of tenant health. All eyes this week will continue to focus on objective indicators that we are, quote, bending the curve in COVID-19 spread as commercial real estate professionals contemplate what procedures they will need to implement to keep or quickly put their assets back into service. On the capital market side, both sales and debt transactions continued their slow pace last week, but transactions are still closing. Continuing a recent trend, most sales and finance deals are in the multifamily or industrial space, though several large office buildings changed hands. The agencies, as well as banks and life insurance companies, completed financings, including one for a retail shopping center. Even debt financings for hotels are beginning to slowly come back into the market. With the Fed expanding the TALF program to purchase debt further out on the risk spectrum, including CMBS, we are beginning to see declining loan spreads. Late this week, Treasury gave deadline relief to 1031 or like-kind exchange buyers, allowing them to extend their period of designation to July 15, 2020. This will help investors seeking an exchange, but will remove one of the more active buyers during this challenging market period. Capital sources are offering different forms of debt and equity capital to bridge troubled assets throughout this period. But at the same time, many banks have shown greater flexibility in adjusting covenants and providing additional liquidity that will help debt-heavy real estate operators through the second quarter of 2021. While the denominator effect diminished institutional investor appetite for private real estate, price discovery is the larger issue suppressing transaction volumes. Investors are having trouble projecting future valuations due to the uncertainty of rent rolls. In the week ahead, A fourth round of stimulus is in the works in Congress and may come with additional guidance from the Treasury and Fed on bond purchases and other actions that will directly benefit the commercial real estate industry. Now for my conversation with Melina Cordero. Well, it's great to have you, Melina. And Melina, you've been at CBRE now for about five years and you ran retail research for about four years and now you're running retail sales and you've had a diverse career prior to that. But we're so proud of how you got here, Uh, not only of your skill, but let's call it what it is, Melina. You're a very young person in an older person's industry. You're a woman in a male-dominated industry. How'd you get here? I I had what what most people would refer to as an unconventional and very winding path through urban planning to consumer goods research to a tech startup to land here about four years ago to to build up our retail research platform, which was which was really fun. And as of about eight months ago, as you mentioned, leading our capital markets team, I think if we think about retail and all the dimensions that it entails, right, everything from economics to psychology to finance, it's a space where the more diverse your background, the better. Uh, to really understand what it is and where it's going as a sector. So, Melina, you're now leading retail sales in what is probably the most challenging period, perhaps in retail's history, as the last 40, 30 days and the next several months are going to be very challenging for the retail industry, as we've seen challenges with rent collections, retailers being shut down, particularly restaurants and other experience retail. Melina, what's going on today in the retail space? Well, it's exactly as you said, it is extremely challenged right now, but if there is any sector that that is familiar to challenge and able to work through it, it's retail, I do have to say. So what we're facing right now is, as most people know, uh, a lot of landlords who are collecting a very small proportion of rents, uh, we're estimating from our conversations anywhere between 20 and 40% on average of retail 
renters are paying. Uh, and so what does that mean? That means that investor clients are going to struggle to pay their bills to their lenders and keep their people uh, engaged and employed. At the same time, we have a lot of relief coming to the industry, a lot of attention on the industry because it is so challenged. So we have aid coming through to consumers in the form of, of, of unemployment and, and checks. We have SBA loans that are going to help so much of that local retailer tenant base pay their rent and pay their people. And then we have what we hope to be some forbearance on the part of lenders and some regulation that comes through from the federal government that allows landlords to work with the tenants and and relieve some of that pressure on paying their bills. Retail also was hit by a little bit of a double whammy, not only because of the shutdown of the stores, so many stores, but also because of their capital structures where so many of them are saddled by conduit or CMBS debt, which seems to be the most inflexible. How is that going to impact the ability of retail to work itself out of this problem? We don't have an answer quite yet on exactly how the lending community is gonna, gonna respond because right now we're still in the phase of who's paying retail rents so that we can go to the lenders and figure out what the solution is for the next one to three months. Now, the good news is that a lot of the conversations that we've had with our retail investor clients who are speaking with their lenders is that we found a lot of partnership and flexibility on the part of lenders across the lending types, right? Um, to understand the situation and offer some level of deferral or forbearance. Two years from now, looking back, what do we see about retail and how does it look then? Fundamentally, the trends that we've been seeing over the past couple of years uh, towards food and beverage, towards entertainment, towards e-commerce resistant categories, as we call them, I don't think that's going to change. Where it will look different, and this may be invisible to the consumer, is behind the scenes and what's on paper and how we think about retail. So the fundamental shift that we've had in the merchandise mix of retail over the past couple of years needs to be accompanied by some pretty fundamental shifts in how we measure retailers, how we report sales, how we measure the performance of assets. Is it sales per square foot for owners? Is it conversion rates for tenants? All that has to change. So lease structures will change valuation methods will change. So for all of those landlords that we said over the last 10 years, you should shift your tenant mix to more experienced retail. They didn't make a mistake. This is still the future. No, I don't think they made a mistake at all. I think they did exactly what was needed to be done, given, again, the, the twin trends of fundamental shifts in demographics and big changes from e-commerce. If there have been any mistakes, and I'm, a, I'm hesitant to call it a mistake because I, I think it's more of an adjustment that needs to happen rather than a mistake, is that the old rules don't work for the new game. And continuing to try and force a totally new tenant mix into the old rules of sales per square foot and occupancy ratios, that doesn't fit anymore. And that needs to evolve. So if there are any mistakes made, it's that we have not moved quickly enough and to adjust our metrics and our ways of thinking. What is your perspective globally on where retail is going and how do we learn about what might happen here in the United States when we compare our experiences to what happened in London or perhaps in Asia? I think a lot of times we think that we're on the vanguard, we're on the forefront of, of sort of every major trend. And that's not always the case in retail. If you look at Asia, They've been a lot more advanced than a lot of U.S. environments around things like technology and mobile payments and things like that. Um, so that's not always the case. Um, you know, one of the things we're seeing is in the reopening of retail, as is happening over there right now, is definitely a sort of phased opening. So you mentioned it earlier around uh, what, what they're seeing in Austria. But for example, in, in food and beverage establishments, that they have more space between the tables, that they're limiting the occupancy at, at peak hours. In movie theaters, they're taking their temperature before they walk in and instituting sort of checkerboard seating with more space between seats. So I think we can expect to see that here, too, to a certain degree as we ramp back up. Is that long term? Are we going to have checkerboard seating in movie theaters a year and a half from now? I don't think we'll have checkerboard seating 10 years from now. However, I do think we may have larger seats, more luxurious set up there within movie theater. So I was thinking about this the other day with, with some colleagues. And this, if we spend three months uh, at home, 
and we've gotten used to watching digital content and maybe a lot of us have gone out and bought bigger screen TVs because the idea of watching all this content on a smaller screen is just insufferable. Um, so there may be some fundamental changes there and what's already been happening in the movie theater industry is a move to diversify the offering. So you're not just walking in and having popcorn in a movie, you're having a drink, you're having dinner, they may serve it at your seat, the seats are more comfortable, they're more luxurious. And I think that this may drive a continuation there. And I think the other trend we'll see is retailers being uh, a lot more uh, health and safety conscious and a lot more communicative with consumers about what they're doing and measures they're taking to keep you safe and healthy in their establishments. There will be both visible and invisible changes in our industry moving forward. What are some of those visible and invisible changes in retail, Molina? So... If you look at how this current environment has impacted just the U.S., I mean, look at how differently it's impacted Manhattan than it's impacted Kansas, right? It's a very different environment. And so the future of retail in a heavily dense, concentrated environment like a downtown may be very different than a more open, less dense suburban location. And that's something that retailers and owners are going to need to think about. And I think the legacy of this environment is going to vary greatly depending on, on where we are and who we're talking about. Well, let's talk about that a little bit further in this new word that I learned that I'm having trouble pronouncing called digital, half physical, half digital retail, which means <laughs> more personal, more techie, more half in the store, half online. What is going to happen to e-commerce sales moving forward and how much of that is going to be a partner to retail? How much of it is going to be a competitor to, to bricks and mortar retail? I think that we will see a short-term acceleration in e-commerce for a lot of categories, especially grocery. But I do think there's going to be a bounce back to brick and mortar for all the reasons that it's continued to, to be over 80% of, of retail sales. And this question of whether e-commerce is a foe or a partner is really down to the retailers and the owners of real estate. It's up to us, the players, to decide how we're gonna leverage uh, e-commerce. And so you've seen really large uh, successes among retailers who have learned how to open up an e-commerce platform, invest in e-commerce, but drive traffic to the store at the same time with things like buy online, pick up in store, and have had a lot of success in that. Part of the challenge and the reason why we see e-commerce as a foe in a lot of cases is because we haven't adjusted the way that we measure retail and retail real estate. Because if we continue to base retail success on sales per square foot, e-commerce is the worst. We don't want e-commerce. But if we expand our definition and our valuing of retail real estate by the role that a store plays for holistic sales in a market, for example, well, e-commerce is very much a partner there. To the extent that we are going to see a short-term bump in e-commerce, and we already have this month, uh, retailers really need to be thinking about how they leverage that moving forward and, and maintain traffic to the store. Well, speaking of maintaining traffic to the store, there's a phenomenon that our friend and colleague, Henry Chin in Hong Kong has coined, revenge retail, about the queues of people lining up in front of restaurants and luxury goods stores after they opened up the doors in cities like Hong Kong and in and countries like Singapore. Do you feel that we're gonna have that same burst of, I wanna to go to a restaurant here in the US? I do think that there's going to be, you know, whether you call it revenge retail or pent up demand, there is going to be a surge uh, in certain categories. So things like apparel, I have a, I, I have a gut feeling, so I'm, I'm very curious to see how it plays out, that furniture and home furnishing sales are gonna shoot through the roof. And we've all spent one to three months cooped up in an, an apartment or a house, and we are absolutely sick of what we're seeing every day. So I'd be curious to see if that, that sees a lot of revenge purchases. I think in other categories like food and beverage and entertainment, the ramp up is going to be a little bit slower. And some of that's gonna depend on consumers' comfort with going back to crowded spaces. Some of that's gonna do with how bad the unemployment situation gets and whether our disposable income is affected uh, significantly by this period. But we'll see variations by category in, in that revenge retail, as you call it. Let me ask you, Molino, what's the first thing you're going to do 
when they open up the doors and you can go out and shop again? One thing that I personally uh, have been thinking about a lot, and I, and I think it's reflected out with a lot of other consumers, how much the retail sector is built on small, local, entrepreneurial players. So much. So much of the sector, so much of even major institutional investors are built on those kinds of tenants. And so I feel like my immediate desire is to run and support those local players in my town, in D.C. and wherever I go, to keep them afloat. Well, Melina, let's go back to the sales market, the capital markets for a moment here. Obviously, things are very challenged today. Rent collections are way down, and there are certain categories more challenged than others. But every investor is asking me the same question. Where are the opportunities today, and how should I best position myself to buy uh, over the next year? What What do you think? In looking at the retail landscape and the different asset types, I actually think you're seeing a continuation of a lot of what we saw before, which is uh, the darling of the industry continuing to be grocery anchored centers, centers that are less dependent on e-commerce penetration, for example, uh, doing very well. That's not going to change, I don't think, fundamentally. Uh, One of the questions on everyone's mind, which we don't have the answer to yet, is how many retailers survive, especially in the big box space. That's going to determine where there are challenges on the owner side, but also opportunities for either buyers or redevelopment, which I think could open up a lot of opportunities for players. We are seeing the lenders being much more flexible uh, than um, I thought was possible to help a lot of these retailers out, certainly the landlords uh, in the public arena and in the private arena, but do you think there's going to be a lot of distressed opportunities in the near future? I think there could certainly be some distress opportunities. Absolutely. There's no denying that. But I also think that lenders are continue to be what you describe, which is very flexible. You also have to think about the lenders. A lot of those, especially in the special servicers, uh, aren't necessarily equipped to handle the volume of issues that they're having and requests uh, and forbearance, right? And so they may not necessarily want to take on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of assets at once. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of understanding on the part of landlords to, or lenders, I should say, to work with owners to help them solve their capital issues. Well, Melina, we're all professionals here trying to help our clients every day in a, an extraordinarily challenging environment, but we're both people, we both have families. How's your family? How are you holding up during this crisis? Yeah, I'm doing well. You guys are keeping me very busy and retail never sleeps. So I've been fine. And my family is also thankfully fine. They are, I've got two siblings and two parents that are holed up in a house in South Jersey, what people affectionately refer to as the Jersey Shore. Although I I usually don't tell everyone that, but I guess now it's it's fully public. (laughs) Well, I had one of the best vacations of my life when I was a kid in Surf City, which hopefully is not far from where you are. Is that close to where your parents are? Wow. It's about a 10 minute drive. I think I worked there in the summers when I was in middle school and high school. Well, I hope to visit that beach again this summer and I hope we all have the opportunities to go to these beaches as well. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope you and your family stay safe. Well, thanks Spencer. And the same to you. For more insights, go to cbre.com slash the weekly take. Until next week, I'm Spencer Levy. Be smart, be safe, be well.